The Psychology of Teaching – How to Create an Engaging PowerPoint Presentation for Your Students 5 Practices Recommended by Psychologists Hi, this is Vojku Michnia. Welcome to this mini-lecture. A mini-lecture which I like to put at the intersection of psychology, pedagogy and design. I hope that by the end of the lecture you will understand what psychologists believe an effective PowerPoint for our students should look like. This mini lecture is split into three parts. In the first part, we will look at the life and career of psychology professor James Gotzik. In the second part, we will look at how to use PowerPoint presentations in your classroom. And in the third part, we will look at the five recommended presentation practices by psychologists. Obviously, this lecture is based on Professor James Gottsick's work and his ideas. So I believe it is important for you to watch the full presentation. But in case you are here just for the five recommended practices, feel free to use the chapter sections in the progress bar below and skip straight ahead to that part of the video where I give you the five recommended practices. Let's look first at the life and career of Professor James Gotzik. In a recent press release from Morehead State University in Kentucky, I have found out that Professor James Gotzik has passed away. So in a way, this video presentation is an in memoriam, is a way to remember his work and his influence in teaching and in our understanding of how PowerPoint presentations should look like. Now, when I say PowerPoint presentation, I actually refer to multimedia presentations, which is actually the title of his paper in which he presented these ideas. But I think the most popular software used by teachers when they create their presentations is PowerPoint, hence the title. Professor James Gottsick has passed away on October 13, 2020, at the age of 86, after a long battle with Alzheimer's disease. He had a Bachelor of Science and a Master of Education from Pennsylvania State University. He also held a doctorate in psychology from Syracuse University, and he used to be a research associate in psychology at Purdue University and a research associate in psychiatry at the University of Kentucky. Let's look now at Dr. James Gotzik's career. He was a faculty member at Morehead State University since 1968, and he was involved in academia at all levels. Maybe what he is remembered most by his students is the fact that he allowed his students to bring three by five note cards filled with notes for his exams. Basically, he allowed his students to bring cheat sheets to exams. That's just out of this world. But why? Because he believed that students learned more from making these notes than they did doing anything else. And actually, research in how, how memory works and in how students should review for exams has shown us that reviewing through question types methods, where you write the question and you write the answer on a note card and then you quiz yourself or you quiz a friend, are more effective than just going over your notes or rereading the textbook. He was also an author and co-author of numerous articles in professional publications, he was granted emeritus status in 1997, and he continued teaching part-time until he officially retired from Morehead State University in 2001. Now, I have this in-house joke at my school in my psychology class. I tell students, if I show you a picture of a middle-aged older man with a beard, he has to be a psychologist. And I know it's a biased statement, but think of, you know, the classical 
Sigmund Freud picture with his, you know, with his cigar in his hand. And I challenge my students to think, to ask questions. Why? Why is this the case? And that little joke of ours, it's actually valid in this presentation where James Gottsick had these huge handlebars, which actually he was very famous for. So by his looks, he is, he was a psychologist. So Jim Gottsick was born on November 29th, 1933 in Casca, Pennsylvania. Very interesting fact, he served as a cryptographer in the Korean War and was widely known in Moorhead for his spectacular handlebar mustache. His research interest was in optic illusions and how the brain worked when we saw them. When I present the life and work of psychologists to my students or to in such a small mini lecture like, like this one, I like to introduce some memorable quotes from the life or the works of these psychologists because it helps students you know, connect with the psychologist or with the person I'm presenting. So James Gottsick had some great advice for his own children. He said, work really, really hard when you first get a new job because you're coast on that reputation for years. And the other one, I hope I've taught you not to do stupid things, but if you do, make sure you don't get caught. Some great light-hearted quotes that, you know, show a different angle, a different perspective of who James Gottsick was outside of his academic life, outside of his career, or outside of academia. He lived in California, obviously being taken care of by his family as he was suffering of Alzheimer's disease. Now, the reason why Moorhead University's press release caught my eye was the fact that I remembered Gottsick as the psychologist who wrote a very important article, at least for my career as a teacher. And this article influenced my teaching style ever since I read it many, many years ago. That article is called Multimedia in the Classroom. And as you can see, it was published in 1996 in Behavior Research Methods, Instruments and Computers, a scientific journal, and was co-authored with his wife, Priscilla Gottsick. Now, in 1996, an article about multimedia, how is that even remotely relevant to today's world? Well, actually, it is very, very relevant. And if, we, if you want to read the article, I, leave the, I will add a link in the description below. But if you look beyond the technological problems that he suggests and that he believes teachers might encounter in their teaching practice, and you look at the concepts and the psychological thinking into how to create a presentation, you'll see that his, his results, his research is still valid today. So the paper focused on setting up a system for developing and displaying multimedia classroom presentations that is both economical and easy to learn. He then goes on to explain some of the obstacles that teachers face when presenting, when preparing multimedia presentations. And in my opinion, why some online lessons have failed in today's world. He says, unfortunately, there are three obstacles that seem to arise when the use of educational multimedia is considered. And if we look at the reference, again, a 1994 reference, what's wrong with multimedia in higher education, makes us again ask the same question, how is this research still relevant today? Well, we'll see that these three obstacles that he saw are still valid today. First, a major investment in faculty time is required to develop useful material. And if you are a teacher, you know this is so true. 
in this world of quarantine, of lockdowns, of COVID, we had to teach our classes online and we had to prepare for a different kind of delivery. And let me tell you that it is much, much more difficult to deliver a lesson online and it is much more time consuming to prepare for such a lesson as opposed to just walking into a classroom and delivering a lesson face to face in front of your students. The preparation time is like two, three, four times more when you are delivering a lecture online. Second, many of the software packages used to develop multimedia material involve a steep learning curve. Now I know that we're all used to PowerPoint, but let's not think that everyone has PowerPoint. For example, I'm using GoodNotes 5, a new application, because I don't really like PowerPoint. Actually, I hate PowerPoint and I, I don't use it that often, but I'm trying to use a different application, GoodNotes 5, to create these presentations like this one right now. And there is a learning curve to understand how to use it. Also, finally, the cost of hardware and software can be prohibitive. Exactly. To use this application, I bought a new iPad and the iPad costs money. The application, if I wanted to use, if I want to use the full features, costs money too. So all these three obstacles are still here today. All three of these obstacles must be overcome in order to reach the point where multimedia is an effective teaching tool. To prepare two, three hours for one lesson to deliver online is ridiculous having in mind that you, may, you might have in a day or in a week 10, 15 lessons to deliver. So time, you see, time was, was identified even from the very beginning as an impediment in creating effective multimedia presentations. Also, there is a recommendation to start with basic products. In our case, that's PowerPoint. The ideal situation would involve relatively low startup costs and rapid development of a usable product. So PowerPoint is quite readily available. And I think once you use it once or twice, three times, maybe you kind of get the gist of it. I think it's it will be the same with me and GoodNotes 5, although I'm still struggling to use it. The other very important mention that Gottsig made in his paper was that content should be the focus of your PowerPoint. Content is the focus of your PowerPoint and not the fancy transitions, fancy animations, the colors, the, um, the bullet points that, that bounce off from the, from the top left corner to wherever the, the note is on, on the PowerPoint. No, content is more important. All of these can enhance student understanding of the material, but the instructor must be sure that the content itself remains the focus of the presentation. I have seen so many PowerPoints that were actually pretty bad, but they had amazing features, amazing transitions, amazing like gimmicks. That's not actually that useful because the purpose of the PowerPoint is to get the message across to the students in, a, in the most effective way. So for an effective PowerPoint, you would need to have it fluid in a non-linear manner. The research says, therefore, it is important that the presentation material be organized in such a way as to avoid rigidity. One of the advantages of the lecture approach is that it lends itself to a non-linear approach. That is, the instructor can deviate from the planned presentation on the basis of questions or comments. So a PowerPoint is not set in stone. Actually, a PowerPoint presentation for a class should be like an intersection, like a way to lead the students to a certain point of understanding, to present certain points of knowledge. But these PowerPoint presentations should be like a two-way affair, 
it's not just any that is so boring for the for the teacher to just go through a PowerPoint like endlessly and the students are passive receptors of that PowerPoint. No, it should be an interactive way. And that is why a non-linear approach is important so that the students can also ask and lead the conversation and maybe the path to achieving knowledge, to acquiring knowledge. Now, some of the potential problems of creating multimedia presentations are obviously their time consuming to create. The most obvious problem in the development of multimedia presentation grows out of the amount of time involved in the process. And I've touched upon this already. It is crazy, crazy time consuming to create a very, very comprehensive PowerPoint presentation. And that's why the previous comment of a PowerPoint presentation to be fluid and non-linear is very important so that it is easier to create when you leave a few doors open, right? Okay, so if the conversation, if the discussion goes towards this, di towards this direction, then we'll continue here. Now, teachers have to understand, fancy doesn't mean better. A fancy, beautiful, colorful transitions in a PowerPoint presentation doesn't make it a good presentation. The multimedia computer has a great deal of potential, but it is not necessary or desirable to use all of its functions in the first lecture, even though it may seem fun to try. Animation, sound, and color are fine, but the meat of any presentation is going to be found in the same text and graphics that appeared on the chalkboard a few years ago. Professional multimedia designers stress that the key to using color and motion is to use it conservatively. Basically, you don't want to add every single function of that PowerPoint presentation in just one slide. Actually, in my opinion, PowerPoint presentation should be very basic, should be like a skeleton, a keyword, a definition, a question, a picture to illustrate that definition, a theory simplified in just one or two sentences, so that the focus of the PowerPoint is not how fancy it is. Ooh, I know how to make all these crazy transitions, but the content that you need to present to the students, that's what they have to walk out of the classroom with, the content, not how fancy the presentation was. So, in that case, a clean design is better. An uncluttered background improves image clarity, which aids comprehension. Designing relatively simple screens that focus attention on a single graphic or text field reduces development time while making the content of the presentation more accessible to the students. If we ignore the fact that this is a reference to an article written in 1995, this is like so, so true today. And this is like pure psychological research. Clear background aids comprehension. Simple screen helps students focus. If there are too many things in your presentation, then what are the students going to focus on? The presentation and its fancy transitions or the content itself. So again, content is more important than presentation. Simple is more important than too fancy, too complex. And now let's look at the five recommended presentation practices by psychologists. Number one, student reaction to multimedia presentation should be careful monitored. Let's not forget we live in a world of multimedia, of gadgets. So you are out there running through your PowerPoint while the students are sleeping at their desk or they're checking their phone or they're playing a game on their laptop and you think they're listening. You have to always monitor the students and create a report with the students by asking questions, by engaging them in 
in whatever you're presenting on the whiteboard by attracting their, their attention and their interest to your presentation. So monitoring, like feeling the, the audience is very important. Regardless of how fancy your presentation is, if nobody's paying attention, there's no point in your presentation. Number two. If a great deal of text is being displayed, students have a tendency to copy it all and become frustrated if they can't keep up. That's why you should not have three paragraphs in like very, very small font on your PowerPoint. On the contrary, you should have very few words, a few sentences, big font so everyone can see it. If people want to write it down, they can write it down. But no, absolutely not like adding like huge chunks of paragraphs. And then what's even worse is the teacher goes and reads the paragraph word for word from the PowerPoint. Then what's the point of the teacher if you're just gonna go there and just parrot whatever someone else wrote and then you're presenting it, presenting it, reading it off a PowerPoint. If we expect the students to be engaged in the PowerPoint, we can't have them write down text that they can easily find on the internet or in, in the textbook. And I know some teachers don't like to share their PowerPoints with the students, which is pretty silly because right now access to information is everywhere. If you really have a text that you want to share with the students, you can add it as an appendix to your PowerPoint and have the students read it after. You can share the PowerPoint with the students so there's no need for them to write down everything that you you present. Number three, text should be displayed in small chunks, which links to number two and to number one, engagement, small text, fewer words, and in small chunks. Number four, in order to keep students actively involved, occasional screens should ask a question or require a student response. Now, this this paper, these recommendations are from a 1996 paper and look at how valid they are. Just think about it, how there are so many teachers who go through a PowerPoint and at the end they have some questions and tell the students, okay, now answer the questions or do it for homework. No, you should add these questions after every three, four, five slides to engage the students. Again, point number one to check for comprehension. Have they understood what I've just presented? Because if they haven't, you need to go back and like present it in a different way or make some clarification. Sometimes these questions are segues into the next section of the PowerPoint presentation, of your presentation. So it is good to have the students involved as much as possible, both in the, the lecture and the transfer of knowledge itself, but also in the dynamics of the lesson, right? Just imagine how boring it is when teachers just stand there and they go blah, 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 read from the PowerPoint. No, we need to have it like a two-way process where both teacher, lecturers and students are engaged at as many levels as possible. Comprehension level, agency level, like what do you think? What is your opinion? And also, to create a flow to your lesson using questions to run, to move forward your class. And five, the instructor should aim for some predetermined level of active involvement on the part of the students. Again, active involvement on the part of the students. Now you tell me, how many times have you seen that teacher who lectures for like 20, 30 minutes? Let's, let's, let's consider high school uh, environment here for 20, 30 minutes with no, with not even asking or making, asking a question or making eye contact with the student. And that is such, such a boring teacher. And then the lecture is boring. Then guess what? The subject is boring. And then guess what? Nobody wants to study it. So these are the five recommended presentation practices by psychologists based on James Gottsick's research. If there was anything I would like to add, I would put at number six, humor. Add a bit of humor in your lectures so that you, you know you create that smile on the student's face 
and then the students are, you know, they have good positive emotions, relaxed atmosphere in your class. For example, in this presentation, I put James Gottsick's picture with his black cat and I'm a huge lover of black cats and I put black cats in my, in my presentations and the students love it and it's there as you can make reference to it or you can totally ignore it and have the students like giggle about it. So these are the five recommended practices and I hope you found them useful. I would really love to know in the comment section below if you're a teacher, what's, what's your favorite PowerPoint gimmick? What's your favorite technique of engaging students in your PowerPoints? How do you do it? If you're a student and you're preparing for a presentation, consider these elements and also let me know what is the most interesting PowerPoint presentation you have seen at your school. Also, check out some of these other videos. You might find them interesting. All right, until next time, this is Vojko Mihnia signing off from Beijing. Ciao.